Ted's getting the camera set up and uh, our speaker is getting antsy. I'm going to go through the administrivia. It's Sunday morning at Shmukon. Everybody had a good night? This is a lot more people than I thought we were going to have, which is good. Um, it, did it really? The tab lasted until 11? Holy cow. That's not bad. That's a pretty big bar tab, too. Um, I mean, it's, it's tough to walk into a bar and just write a check before you start drinking. And so you always wonder, like, are we going to drink that much? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're going to drink that much. Um, but I was shocked. They came back here earlier. There were people working on the contest. There's a lot of stuff going on. A lot of people hit the rave next door, which was fantastic. Apparently, it was quite a good rave. So uh, next year, maybe we can, like, have a commingled Shmukon anime thing, and you can all dress up as your favorite hacker character. Um, there aren't many. Everyone will dress up as Captain Crunch. I mean, that's the easy one. You go yourself the whistle, and you go. Um, so a couple, couple quick notes. Uh, for those that are doing the badge contest, I know there's a number of folks. Clue number two is posted above the registration desk now. Um, I, I think it's helpful, question mark. If you're doing the contest, it, it should be. And if you're not, um, it probably won't give you any more insight as far as how to solve the badges, because it's relatively complicated. Um, not that you're not smart and all. I didn't mean to imply that. You just hung over. Um, room split, 1 o'clock. And we'll just be reminding you of this all day at one. Just leave the room so we can sort this out and make this one big room. We'll have the closing plenary and closing remarks after that. Um, doors. We have doors in these rooms, and people come in and out of them. That's the nature of the doors. The doors make a lot of noise, and so do the people in the hallway. So <clears throat> two things. One, try to go in and out as quickly as possible. But two, try to use your ninja-like skills so the door doesn't make a lot of noise. There is like a process to do that where you can open the handle, and you open the door, and as you close the door, leave the handle kind of pushed or open or whatever, and then shut it, and it doesn't go click at the end. Because um, I think some speakers are thinking about bringing in weapons and solving the door opening problem themselves. So um, just try to be aware. Um, it's, uh, it is a bit of an issue. And finally, uh, <coughs> feedback forms. Um, please, 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 please fill out the yellow feedback forms. I don't care if you have to do it from memory from yesterday. Um, please do it. It's uh, very valuable to us. Uh, as a conference organizers to know what worked and what didn't. Uh, we kind of go out of our way to try to give people an opportunity to talk that maybe haven't been able to get on stage before and present their ideas because we want to be able to get new ideas into uh, the community. And it's important that we get feedback on those speakers to help us out on selection and to help these speakers out to do a better job in the next go-round. So if you can fill those out, at the end of the day, there'll be a box of registration. Drop them off or um, you know, give them to any staff member on the way out. You can even crumple them up. We'll take care of it. Just get it to us. Um, we speaker feedback forum. I think a couple of years ago, we barely had enough data points, maybe two data points per speaker, and there were, you know, 800 people here, so that wasn't really cool. Uh, so please uh, give us more than two data points. Just uh, write down your thoughts and, and send it in. And I think that's all the administrative. Sir? Oh, it's coming back up. Sweet. We were down a projector. This time it was the other projector that's flaking out today, so we'll see if we can keep them both up. Uh, Dan Griffin's going to talk about uh, Vista security. You're not with Microsoft, correct? Excellent. Black Hat, uh, a couple years ago, had a track of Vista, Windows Vista security that was all like Microsoft employees, and I thought that was kind of an interesting way to tackle that problem. Um, am I supposed to give these away? Oh, man. I'm so bad at the giveaways. It's, it's not even funny. So we're just throwing over here. No, no, but we'll, we'll, I'll come up with some long, convoluted question. Um, has anyone played Galaga yet? All right, sir, your, your, your hand was the first. What was your score? 25,000. 25,000. So you at least crested the 20,000 mark. That's, that, that's good. Uh, for you, we have a, um, a special Schmoo limited edition uh, multi-tool thingamabob with the eyes on it and a fantastic shirt from O'Reilly that prompted my son to ask, hey, what's animal magnetism really mean? Uh, uh, it means they like each other. Uh, <laughs> Software developers in the room. How many software developers? Uh, language of choice. C. English. There you go. Who's, who was that? <laughs> All right. Here, come here, sir. You can get yourself uh, <laughs> writing great code, thinking low level, writing high level from uh, No Star Express. That was the kind of answer I wanted. So thank you very much. Um, Dan's going to uh, school us on uh, Vista security, please, God. Uh, if I can make one comment, I think Microsoft is. 
um, doing a rather interesting job right now trying to solve some pretty complex security problems that uh, most of the academic and commercial community has left on the table for the last 20 or 30 years. Um, and it's interesting to see what state VISTA is in and what we're able to do to it as an operating system. So I'm actually very curious about this talk. Um, but we, we've actually kind of gone beyond this Windows bashing stage and have entered a point where maybe Windows isn't starting to suck as much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry. I mean, yeah, most people have already packed so their schmoo balls. Um, but I think the open source community is going to be in for a run for its money here shortly as Microsoft gets its uh, system really in gear. So uh, anyway, I'm curious to hear what you have to say, but unfortunately I have to go do other stuff. Uh, so I'll watch you on video. But here's Dan. Okay, can you guys hear me? <laughs> I only heard smart-ass remarks, so I believe that means yes. Uh, thanks a lot for coming out. I know uh, first talk the morning after the party, you guys are the hardcore ones, and uh, I recognize that, so again, thank you. And you'll notice that I'm losing my voice for similar reasons. Um, my name is Dan Griffin. I'm a software security consultant in Seattle. Um, I did actually used to work for Microsoft. Um, that's how I learned most of what I'm going to talk about tonight, um, this morning, sorry. Um, but I don't work there anymore. Um, these tools that I'm going to show you, there are four of them. Three of them were written by my company on contract for Microsoft, the code anyway, on contract for Microsoft to be MSDN samples. The first one is actually not in that category. That's just something I wrote for myself. Um, but what's interesting about these tools is that, um, well, for one thing, it's, it's kind of rare for Microsoft to actually create MSDN samples that are useful. And I think that these tools actually show a useful solution to a problem in kind of an end-to-end -end way. And they also expose some security questions. Uh, so I think that's also a rarity for MSDN samples. Although if you've ever cut and pasted code out of MSDN, you should know you've created security problems, just so you're all aware of that. <laughs> uh, OK, so these, this code that I'm going to show you is C and C++. I'm not going to show any C and C++ today. But unless you're pretty comfortable with those languages, you're, you're probably not going to be real comfortable with playing around with the tools. So Apologies if you're not a C, a C programmer. The code is free. Again, except for the first tool, I haven't decided to make that code available yet. If you're interested, we can talk about that. Uh, the topics are smart cards, crypto, firewall, and IPsec. Here's the first one. <coughs> Hacking smart cards. Um, what I'm going to show actually is, is fuzzing smart card middleware. Um, OK, so just to get the dumb questions out of the way first. What's fuzzing? Fuzzing is a a software testing methodology wherein you're sending random inputs uh, to a program. And then you see what happens. And typically, you're rewarded with the program blowing up in some way. What's a smart card? A smart card is one of these. It's basically a credit card with a SIM chip on one end. Um, a lot of people in the US probably haven't seen a smart card before. Or at least maybe you've seen one, but not actually used one. Um, Anyway, Pretty much everybody working for the federal thank you, thank you. So I'm, I'm pre-selected for people who, ha who have been exposed to smart cards here. Good point, thank you. Um, there are other form factors. You can basically take the SIM chip and put it in a USB key fob, which is also pretty common because you kind of get a two or three for one there in terms of what the device can do. What's smart card middleware? Um, middleware is, is basically the operating system plugins that are required in order to know how to talk to a specific smart card. Generally, each vendor's card has its own command set. Some are pretty similar. Some are totally dissimilar. So you need software that knows how to do that. I just want to do a quick, this is probably the scariest of the four diagrams, but it really actually makes a lot of sense. Let me just explain it. Um, I just want to show the data flow here as data is read from the smart card and gets up into specifically the demo program that I'm going to show you that we're going to blow up. So starting at the bottom of the diagram, I take the smart card and I insert it into this USB smart card reader. And as a result of that, the operating system, um, Vista specifically, um, actually all versions of Windows since Windows 2000, will automatically read data from that card, just from the act of inserting it. So the data is read from the smart card into the reader device, that's arrow one. Arrow 2 shows the data traversing the USB stack into the smart card reader driver. Okay. 
Arrow 3 takes us out of kernel mode into user mode, where we're now into a system service called, um, I call it S-Card Server there. It's the Smart Card Resource Manager. And the purpose of the Smart Card